turn our attention to a discussion around shaping the future of digital in the UK-India relationship. It's, it's a small topic. Right. Uh, delighted to welcome a repeat guest here to the uh, India Global Forum. His experience ranges from spending time uh, in Silicon Valley, working for Intel, my hometown, California, or my home state, uh, to helping build India's cellular industry. And he sold BPL Mobile for over a billion dollars in 2005. Uh, so he knows a thing or two about entrepreneurship, about unicorns as well. Uh, and he's now Minister of State for Electronics and IT, and Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Um, welcome, Honorable Minister Thank Rajiv you. Chandrasekhar. Thank you for me. How are you today? Good, not too bad. Good, excellent. We run into each other in all the greatest places: I know. Bengaluru, it's a London, I know. Uh, all good. Now, one thing I want to notice, I want to just pause on, because I was re-watching your interview from Bengaluru, and mm -hmm. you were very strong on this point, that your aim for India is to lead the global technology movement, that we'll see more and more of original Indian tech innovation. I was interested, actually, with our, our last guest in terms of just how innovative um, that is. I want you to expand on that mission, on that vision for, for India as the originator of tech innovation, first of all. So, so thank you for having me, and uh, thank you, Manoj, uh, for making this a regular habit uh, of uh, inviting <laughs> me. So more power to that habit. Um, look, you know, in 2015, when the Prime Minister laid out his vision for Digital India, he, brought, he talked about three broad objectives. And he said, technology must empower our citizens and transform their lives for the better. He must, he's talked about the digital economy and increasing the economy, uh, digital economy size and opportunities for youngsters. And he talked about a very, very important, very pivotal third part, which is that India, which has been a consumer of technologies for decades, mm. should join the uh, leading pack of nations or leading pack of uh, companies uh, to drive the future of technology. And he said that with a, a number of different perspectives in mind. One is the real risk that the emerging technologies, the, the future of the internet, the future of emerging technologies goes moves away from... Uh, open democratic societies like ours to being controlled by countries that are not as democratic mm -hmm. or as open as us. So that is a real challenge for a country that is heavily invested in the narrative of a digital economy. And the second is really economic, which is that, for example, when I was an entrepreneur in telecom, every piece of equipment that we used to build our networks in the mid-90s was imported. Mm -hmm the radio, the switch, the microwave, the fiber, the routers, all of that had to be imported and we could, uh, you know, we added value with an Indian-made screwdriver and Indian-made screws. And fast forward to 2022, the vision of the Prime Minister, and you see now in the era of 5G, India is now designing 5G gear, mm -hmm. is manufacturing the devices that go into the 5G products. And so that is what he meant by saying that we have to reach a critical inflection point, and the phrase was used uh, earlier on by somebody else, which is that we've got to become, the uh, rather than being consumers of technology, we need to be able to design, manufacture, and be a trusted source mm. of Where digital products. Where are you in that journey now, do you no, think? I, I think uh, we are very, very uh, far ahead from where we were in, let's say, 2012, 13, yeah. 14. Uh, 5G is a classic example. Mm -hmm. We uh, heard about that earlier, didn't we? Yeah, on the, yeah. and the uh, we, will, we will be equipping, yeah, the Vodafone gentleman mm -hmm. from Vodafone mentioned that, that we would be basically deploying 5G networks in India, private companies doing it, but with Indian design, Indian mm. made gear, uh, which is a big, big, big jump for a nation that has been a consumer of technologies for decades. Mm. I think that's absolutely fascinating. If we have a look at, um, at the UK-India relationship, this, was this whole uh, mm -hmm. last day and a half has been about, tell me about the importance of it from a digital perspective and where you'd like to see even further collaboration than we have now. No, I, I actually think there's a lot that India and uh, Britain, India and UK can do together. And uh, earlier in the morning, uh, I had the opportunity to sit next to the minister, Chris Philp, and uh, I, I, we shared some ideas. Look, the, the common ground here is the fact that both India and the United Kingdom want to 
dramatically expand the innovation economy piece of their overall economy. And we want to take the digital economy to be 25% of our overall GDP. Uh, the UK government wants to take it, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but they clearly want to expand the slice of that pie. Mm. And that being one, and the other, that the future of technology is going to be determined by collaborative efforts between companies with either offices and teams in two, three, two, three countries or governments that in a sense create equal uh, working environment for these collaborative efforts, that is going to be the secret sauce of success for future technologies. So that is the second point. And the third is the internet and the future of the internet is going to be increasingly determining the success of digital economies, whether it's the UK, whether it's India, whether it's Australia, whether it's the US. And the need for countries like India and UK, both of whom are democracies, both of whom are uh, you know, diverse, open societies, for us to collaborate, cooperate, and work out these global standards and protocols that will shape the future architecture of the internet. So there is plenty of work for us to do uh, together uh, for mutual benefit. And I think increasingly the India-British relationship can be architected to be, designed to be, with outcomes that could be win-win. Hmm. Well, let's, let's look a little bit further at that, because I noticed that in April, uh, the Ministry of Electronics and IT issued a joint de declaration of intent with the UK's Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Mm -hmm. What do you want to achieve with that? Um, look, I, there is, in my opinion, uh, and I said this earlier on in a conversation with the Trade Minister as well, uh, and the Home, Home Secretary, which is that there are many things that India and UK are doing which are essentially driven by narrow uh, pieces, mm. whether it's sports, whether it is skilling. And these type of forums allow us to step back a little bit and say, actually, there is a lot more than these thin slivers of opportunity. There is a larger, broader pie of opportunities. And that declaration was really a declaration that said, look, let's look at all of this from a you know, standpoint of slightly... Uh, a bigger back. picture mm -hmm. uh, of what kinds of cooperations we can do between the two nations. And uh, to that, I'm adding the points that I just, I'm just making about internet regulation, the future of the internet, future of emerging technologies, the future of cooperating together and working out the next generation innovations. Those are all things that India and Britain can do together, India and UK can do together. It's interesting because we are in a, in a moment in time when there are two internets developing. We have an internet that is developing within... Um, countries who want it to remain free and countries like China and Russia, let's be totally honest, who um, wants the state to be involved. How much Absolutely. time do you um, take? Does that keep you up at night worrying about that? No, I'm not, I'm not a worrying kind. But uh, look, I think there is clearly we are, you know, and the word inflection point, the phrase inflection point is being bandied around a lot uh, mm. and, and has the risk of being misused or overused. But I do believe in the growth of the Internet, and the fact that Web 3.0 is around the corner, mm. the fact that the blockchain is around the corner and we are struggling with issues like big tech influence on the internet and what it means to the openness of the internet. We are struggling with safety and trust issues of the internet, but worried about cybersecurity. Yeah. That the internet, which is designed to be a force of good, also represents a force uh, of uh, user harm and mm. uh, online it's safety challenges. Yes. So I think uh, it's not a question of having sleepless nights, but having strategic clarity that the internet must be. And we cannot do this as India alone or UK alone. Mm -hmm. This has to be a coming together of countries that have similar values, open democratic societies and communities, and say, look, we want the internet to be open. We want the internet to be a place where safety and trust is paramount. And we want an internet where these big tech platforms are always accountable to the users. Mm. And that kind of a global understanding translated into standards, rules that are global in nature, or if not global, let's assume Russia and China don't want to be part of that definition of global. Right. But clearly from our point of view, India, the UK, the US, Australia, Japan, South Korea, there are many, many countries that would uh, be, in my opinion, uh, necessary partners to making, uh, shaping the future of this very safe and trusted internet. There's another part of that, which is around data and data sharing and 
and concerns about where data lives. We've heard about it discussed um, in the free trade agreement. It was one of the things that Vodafone mentioned. They want right. to be able to take data, um, anonymize data, and use it elsewhere, bring it from the, the India to the UK. Right. I, and I don't, and I'm asking you, because I know you have a, a recently announced data governance framework. It's in the second, um, second draft now. Right. I actually read it. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear your views on this subject, because it's, it's actually one of the biggest things that we've got to untangle, Absolutely. is what do we do with this? Where does it live? But how should we be looking at it as an issue? So that, that will require an IGF and a separate idea for us <laughs> okay. to discuss this thread bear. But, uh, no, but it's an important topic. I think uh, the data economy and the, the importance of data, the importance of privacy mm -hmm. that has now arisen fr from the fact that consumers have woken up to the risk of their data being misused. Uh, we've seen Cambridge Analytica. We've seen all yeah. of those uh, cases in the past. So uh, I think all of that has created uh, uh, awareness uh, within governments, within regulators, and within consumers that there is something that needs to be done that does not put a, a citizen or a consumer at risk just because he or she is a participant in a data economy. Mm. So that's number one. Number two, it is clear today with the proliferation of the internet and with use usage and applications proliferating as they are, that countries and platforms are generating data like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you've seen data centers come up and, you know, all of this data that has been stored. Now, on one hand, for policymakers like us, on one hand, there is this argument by the Vodafone uh, type companies that says, look, make it easy for us to do whatever we want with the data. Right. So that's one argument. That's an argument that F Facebook would use. That's an argument that uh, Vodafone would use saying, look, don't, don't put any constraints on us. And I'm guessing that you don't believe in that. Oh, uh, well, I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Uh, so that is one little ask of theirs, saying, look, leave us alone. We are innovators, and you are government, and just and leave us worry, alone. Don't we'll yeah, worry, we'll be We'll do trust bad, us. we'll do good. But we are, uh, we are public policy makers, and we have a responsibility to the citizens of our countries, citizens of our communities. And so the, we, we have to look at this from the prism of user safety, user harm, safety, trust, accountability, and all of that. And then there is a third angle, which is the issue of national security, law and order, yep. all of that. Now, somewhere these three lines have to intersect, and we have to come to common ground on what the rules and you know uh, the rules are uh, in terms of how is data stored, who owns the data, what are the uh, conditions, boundary conditions for the use of that data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and how and how it can be monetized too, because that's yeah. another thing that people get. Yeah. So about. the monetization argument is almost often used there. On mm. the other end of the spectrum, nobody wants the uh, data to be monetized, right. except if it's done with consent. So if you look at line these things up, and then say what should we do? I think it basically means that a there has to be some certain basic foundational principles mm -hmm. that have to be established. That privacy is a fundamental right. Non-personal data, who owns non-personal data, personal data, what kind of consent architecture that we have that uh, an, uh, uh, a consumer is not unwittingly giving consent on data to be misused. So this is a complex area that uh, lends itself to pretty sophisticated, nuanced regulation. And it can't be just a question of, look, I'm Mr. X and you know life gets difficult if I have to comply with laws and rules, right. but don't, don't have laws and rules. So that's, number, that's one aspect of the conversation. The second most dangerous aspect, more dangerous issue currently on our radar screen as public policymakers is the issue of the ability of the internet to be weaponized. Yeah. So assume for a minute India is this thriving digital economy, we are growing, we have hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs whose lives and uh, wealth depends on it. Uh, but the internet is not really open in the sense that the influence of the big tech platforms that are domiciled, let's say, in the US or Western Europe are so significant that if, God forbid, uh, one day there's a president of the US who doesn't like what some, something that India does in the United yeah. Nations and he decides, look, I'm going to unplug the internet uh, from India and therefore... Uh, if there is Indian data that is used for the Indian digital economy that is sitting in San Francisco, too bad. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a doomsday scenario. It's not necessarily a scenario that I ever think will come to fruition or will become real. But 
making sure that the internet can never be weaponized against our digital economy leads us to a conversation about should the data then be localized. Yeah. So localization isn't somebody's women fancy. It is really an answer to a question that is being posed. How do you make the internet more resilient? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that the internet cannot be weaponized against our own growing economy? To which a natural answer would be maybe we should explore data localization. Mm -hmm. Now, the answer to that is, does it brute force data localization? Is it mirroring? Is it a copy kept in India versus a copy retained outside? Uh, all of that. So Still the, to be worked uh, so out. So it, it is not just a black and white issue of, uh, like I said, making things difficult for entrepreneurs. That's never going to be our uh, policy yeah. outcome or objective. But to factor in the other uh, requirements that any responsible government and any government responsible to its citizens will have to take into account. Okay, really interesting. Uh, we do need a whole IGF to discuss that, don't so. we? Right, Manoj, take a note there. Yeah. Uh, but I want to look at the economic outlook. Um, and the, la the last six months for Indian startups, have they've had some tough times. We've seen, I think, the loss of about 10,000 employees in the first six months of this year. Now, when I mentioned this, this fact to Mohandas Pai, to Nikhil Kamath, they said, ah, it's natural, you know, this is a, this is a sign of a, a naturally growing ecosystem, these things happen. Now that may be true, and that's fine for an investor and a, and a unicorn to say, but as a, as a policymaker and as a government employee, tell me a little bit about how you see the Indian ecosystem, the startup ecosystem as it is now, uh, and, and were those job losses at all worrying? So, uh here, here's the thing. I, I, as an entrepreneur, have gone through multiple cycles right. of these ups and downs. So you've been there too. So I'm not losing that much sweat or sleep over the fact that there are these vicious ups and downs in these cycles. You know from uh, the history of the global economy, asset bubbles tend to form, valuations tend to be frothy, and then there are corrections. That is on one side in terms of investments and valuation. On the other hand, we also know that every idea isn't a guaranteed success. That's the entire nature of being a startup. I am not pleased by the fact that uh, 10,000 jobs are lost. I can never be. I mean, yeah. that's not uh, something that anybody takes a uh, joy in. But it isn't a very unnatural consequence of uh, startups having a flood of capital thrown at them. Uh, a number of startups, some very rigorously due diligence, some not so. Uh, passing through the scanner of uh, investors. So some of the stuff is, in my opinion, anticipated. But having said that, uh, the the U.S. economic outlook, the Russia-Ukraine mm. uh, situation. It's a bit grim. Yeah, and the overall global economic outlook of being uh, less than stellar mm. um, is, has a dampening effect on everybody in every yeah. industry. It's not just about startups in, in, in particular. It is on any any company, you look at any company today and you look at the stock, um, a blue chip company like Tata Motors has lost value in its stock. Uh, you know, really mm. blue chip companies have uh, corrected in this. So I, I, I wouldn't use that as a symptom of any large, deep problem. I would think that this is really pointing to a, a general uncertainty about the global economy and therefore risk aversion in general. Mm. I don't think it's risk aversion that is in particular directed at Indian startups or startups. Uh, and I suspect that if the Russia-Ukraine issue, you know, uh, God willing or whoever willing gets sorted out soon, <laughs> there will be a complete change in sentiment to the global economy. Interesting. Well, we're running out of time. I want to ask you a final question. There's a target, uh, India's target is to become a $5 trillion economy by 2026. That's, that's just around the corner. Uh, tell me how the digital economy is going to uh, contribute to this. No, it's, it's a good question because uh, the digital, the one, one of the biggest things about the $5 trillion economy goal is the fact that we want uh, digital to be 20% of it. Okay. So trillion dollar digital economy, $5 trillion overall economy, uh, the digital economy goes from being 8% in 2014 to 20% in 2025. Less than 8% in 2014, 6%. Achievable? Um, I actually think we are on track for that. I mean, of course, uh, you know, I have a boss who gives us stretch targets. Uh, our <laughs> Prime Minister 
dares to dream big uh, things uh, way way uh, uh, ahead of everybody else and i i i don't see it as being a target difficult to achieve that at least a trillion dollar piece i also don't think the 5 trillion dollar piece is going to be difficult to achieve now the two years of covid haven't helped no nope. of course uh, so whether it is precisely on uh, the 31st of march 2025 or is it 31st of march uh, 2026 I think that a little bit of leeway you should give us. All right, we'll we'll we'll, we'll consider that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Minister, for thank being you. with us. Thank you for continued friendship with thank India you. Global Forum. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, let's give him a huge round of applause. Thank you very Honourable much, Minister thank you. Jeev thank you. Chandrasekhar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in 